Are you ready? Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day is coming on October 26th. Amazon will host live hiring events in your city to showcase all the reasons why this Amazon Warehouse is the place to work. Things like competitive pay, great benefits, and so much more. Drop in for some swag, bring a friend, and you could even walk away with a job. To find an Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day event close to you, visit Amazon.com slash hiring day. That's Amazon.com slash hiring day. Amazon is an equal opportunity employer. If you look for it, every day has cause for celebration. Celebrate a friend for their promotion baby wedding life thing. Celebrate yourself for keeping the couch warm. It's no easy feat, especially if it's a big couch. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in 2022 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving said couch. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Our very first Reverse Chronological Lightning Round Monday. You guys know what this all means, don't you? If you don't, you will. That's right, every Monday during the regular season, we go backwards through the weekend, Sunday first, Saturday second. Hopefully we don't have to go all the way back to Friday, but usually there's one team that doesn't play over the weekend. And we look at everybody's most recent game to just kind of reset the board for you. First thing Monday, and that helps, I believe, get us set for kind of dealing with the week that's about to be coming in. And that's it. That's the only thing we do on Mondays because that takes the whole show. So to that end, I say hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a sports ethos presentation. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. And as I always do at the beginning, I remind you guys to please do follow me on social media at Dan Bespris. You got to do it. We do a lot, a lot, a lot in between podcasts on social during the season. It cannot wait a full day. Many times it cannot wait a full day. Something happens, you guys might need to put in a, an auction bid before you go to sleep at night, all that type of stuff. And then next morning, we'll obviously recap some things. Leagues where moves happen day of uh, certainly works just fine on the pod front, but it all works together. It's a combo effort. This show and social. So again, that is at Dan Vespers on social media, and uh, Sports Ethos is at Ethos Fantasy BK. Let's start on Sunday. Let's just get right on into this thing because I got mid-show stuff to talk to you about. Portland beat the Lakers in the afternoon. Lakers coughed this one up. They had a pretty good, I think they had like seven-point lead with a minute and a half to go or something, and they just did a bunch of dumb stuff, in uh, including Russ, who went, what, three for fi- 15? No, worse. Four for 15? No, it was four for 15, I think. Yeesh. Yeesh. Lakers. What are, what are we waiting for? Um. From a fantasy standpoint, a couple of things to take out of this ballgame. Not much on the Portland side other than, look, we kind of faded all of the Blazers with the exception of Dame on this show. You know, we had Dame in the old man squad. None of those other guys made the list. I don't like Anthony Simon's fantasy game, especially not as the point guard. That was when he made his hay. Josh Hart is the other Blazer actually kind of doing his part so far. I I wasn't willing to take a risk on him. That one will probably be a miss because it looks like he's playing pretty well until he gets hurt. His knee always ends up getting hurt. 16 rebounds for you know the team's small forward slash shooting guard. That's what he does. But Nurk, one good game, couple of weird ones. Jeremy Grant, what one good game, couple of weird ones. And that's basically just kind of how it's going to be for guys playing alongside a healthy Damian Lillard because he's just better offensively than these other dudes. So if you're thinking about it from a more longer-term perspective, if if you can sell on Anthony Simons, I would. I don't think you can. If you can sell on Grant, I would. I don't think you can. With Nurk, you can probably just hang on. I don't know that it, there's any point in selling. He's just going to be kind of up and down. And then with Josh Hart, whoever drafted him is thinking, all right, cool, I got a decent late-round pick, and you just roll with it. And then Dame, of course, old man squad. LeBron was old man squad. He's been decent so far. Missed his two technical foul shots, but made his other five. 
Uh, Anthony Davis looks really good so far this year, actually shooting 80% at the free throw line so far as well. Had six blocks in this one. Uh, but not sure that anybody else in the Lakers is really going to stay over the cut line. Patrick Beverly seems fine uh, as far as he's like just above streamer level. I think you can probably use him even in a games cap format. He just like he's not involved on offense. So there has to be a lot of defensive stats or it's just it's not going to work. He was a plus seven in this game. Lakers lost by two. Uh, that was the best on the team. It's not a coincidence that Patrick Beverly's plus seven was the best on the team. He's like the only dude on that club that can both play defense and guard somebody. He's like the only guy left. Or sorry, play defense and hit a three-pointer. Excuse me, guard somebody and play defense are the same thing. LeBron can't really guard people anymore. AD can't shoot anymore. Lonnie Walker can shoot sometimes but can't really guard anybody. Austin Reeves hit a couple of three-pointers. Maybe he moves into that discussion, but he's not much of an offensive threat in general. And then Russ who's sort of guarding people, but just absolute trash on offense. Kendrick Nunn's fallen apart. He had a good first game back, but now he can't shoot or guard anyone. Oh, what are you doing with this stuff? In any event, uh, Lonnie Walker, kind of the same story, just barely above streamer level. Between those two guys, I'd probably rather have Patrick Reveley, but between those guys and a bunch of other things going on in the NBA, I don't know that I'm kind of married to either of them. Charlotte beat Atlanta in a blowout. This kind of came out of nowhere. But the big story, once again, is that Nick Richards is playing excellent basketball in the early going. I'm still a little hesitant on the full buy-in. Uh, I'm adding him in every head-to-head -head spot that I can because you're not punished for trotting someone out there on a day where they don't have a great ball game. On the Roto Games Cap side, I'm still just right on the border because he's not starting, and 20 minutes... 20 minutes is enough for some guys. I don't know that it's going to be enough every game for Richards. Obviously, right now it is. But, you know, I think he's a guy you pick up pretty much everywhere and just kind of see how this thing plays out. Because heaven forbid he actually overtakes Mason Plumley, or even they get into a timeshare, which is not quite the case so far. Uh, then you're talking about legit fantasy value. Dennis Smith Jr., terrific stream as long as Terry Rozier is out. That's something that I tweeted about a bunch over the weekend. That's, again, another reason why you need to be on social media. Kelly Oubre, also looking very good so far. Atlanta side, no surprises. Uh, Onyeka Okongwu and Clint Capella almost split the center minutes right down the pipe. And they were both decent, actually, in this one. Okongwu missing two free throws, kind of clouding what was otherwise a pretty good line. Uh, and we'll see how that situation develops over the course of the year. Cleveland, without Darius Garland, beat up on Washington, 117-107. Donovan Mitchell was awesome. 37 points, five boards, four assists, three steals a block. Not to say that this is a sell-high moment, because he's Donovan Mitchell, and you know you're, people know what you're getting right now. But obviously, when Garland is in, he'll do a little bit less. I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'm one of the only analysts I know that was kind of semi-fading Evan Mobley, just because I didn't see, like, a bunch of extra shots coming his way and his defensive numbers were already really good and he's going to be fine again this year and he's going to be solid in a lot of ways but I just like the leap into the 30s that's a long way to go Chetty Osmond's picked up some scoring slack here but who cares Karis Levert played 36 minutes he didn't shoot the ball well if he did this actually would have been a pretty decent ball game but you know that's the thing with him he doesn't always shoot the ball well his percentages are poor I think Levert profiles as a guy you can start while Garland is out. I don't think I would start him when Garland's back. Washington side, zero surprises at all. Monte Morris saw a couple extra minutes in this ball game. Uh, the other guards weren't terrific. He played a little bit better. Um, he's still just Monte Morris. Six assists, one turnover. That's always what he does well. Assist to turnover ratio, but doesn't get steals or blocks. Hit some threes here, but typically doesn't do a ton of that either. And he's just going to be, he's just going to be Monte Morris. Like, he's been fine so far this year. 10 points, 4 boards, 5 assists. He's averaging a steal, although, to be fair, he got 3 in the first ball game and none since. Uh, turnovers are very low, and so that's part of it. And he'll probably, once the rebounds settle back down to normal and the steals settle back down to normal, he'll probably be right around the top 100. That's Monte Morris. That's okay. But if someone looks at that top 70 ranking right now and they're like, oh, cool, top 70, I would consider selling Monty Morris to that team.
Are you ready? Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day is coming on October 26th. Amazon will host live hiring events in your city to showcase all the reasons why this Amazon Warehouse is the place to work. Things like competitive pay, great benefits, and so much more. Drop in for some swag, bring a friend, and you could even walk away with a job. To find an Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day event close to you, visit Amazon.com slash hiring day. That's Amazon.com slash hiring day. Amazon is an equal opportunity employer. If you look for it, every day has cause for celebration. Celebrate a friend for their promotion baby wedding life thing. Celebrate yourself for keeping the couch warm. It's no easy feat, especially if it's a big couch. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in 2022 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving said couch. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Whoever they may be. Utah won again in overtime. I don't know what the hell's going on with the Jazz. I mean, I do know. Uh, Jared Vanderbilt is awesome. Really, do whatever you can to get your hands on that dude. Larry Markin has been unbelievable. First rounder so far this year. Playing uh, 37 minutes of ball game. Shooting pretty well uh, from the field. Not as great from three, oddly enough. Made all 15 of his free throws so far this season. And uh, he's a monster. He's a sell high. But don't sell a little high. Sell, like, way high if you can. You know, like, you drafted him at 80-something. He's better than that. And that's why we had him on the old man squad. Because 80-something was, like, behind a worst-case scenario. Worst-case scenario was probably, like, 70. So this is a dude who can get into the top 50. That's not a surprise at all. Top 40 would be a little bit of a shock if he hung that high. Top 30 would be where you're probably aiming right now. So, like, see if you can grab a third rounder that's underperforming where you still have a lot of confidence in them. I'm actually, I don't have a great example off the top of my head, so a lot of good that did ya. See if we can pull something up on the fly. Who went in the third that's been only kind of fine so far? Um, I don't know, like, Vooch? Vooch has been pretty good, but not Markinen good. <laughs> which is such a funny, like, Vooch has actually been pretty solid so far this year. I think he's, what, is he actually ranked in the 30s so far? The hell are you, Vooch? Uh, 23. Oh, he's been better than I realized. Yeah, you're probably not going to get Vooch. Not, he's been better than I realized. Um, Maybe Siakam, 36. No, because he's been scoring a lot. It's a tough one. Gobert, 37, but that's mostly because his free throws have been horrible. It's going to be tough. Like, all buy lows, sell high stuff in the beginning of the season is difficult to pull off. But just see if you can find someone drafted pretty high who's way underperforming. And then, you know, give a sideways glance their direction. You're not going to get a second rounder. That's too high to aim. Uh, so don't, like, Jimmy Butler at 61 just because he doesn't have any steals so far this year. You're not going to get someone like that. So again, a lot of good this buy has sell high recommendation does for you if you can't even really pull it off. But Kelly Olynyk, 37 minutes. He looks awesome so far this year. Not to get too caught up in the old man success stories. There is other stuff going on with Utah. Uh, for one, Walker Kessler, seven points, nine boards, couple of blocks. He's actually quietly been kind of decent so far this year. Uh, he's number 120. In nine cat because it's free throw shooting is horrendous, but eight points, eight boards, two blocks in 21 minutes a game. He probably does belong on rosters, especially when you consider the fact that at some point they are going to make the move this direction. And when they do, you might as well just kind of be out in front of it. So take a peek. He's pretty heavily rostered for someone who's, uh, whose role is not super secure yet. Um, but at, you figure this will probably go up as the season progresses. And uh, so just yeah, to get him on your roster out in, and stay out in front of it unless something crazy comes along. And then Mike Conley, I'm not worried about it. He had an off-shooting game. He still had eight assists. He still played 36 minutes. He's going to sit out some back-to-backs, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? That's what we knew we were getting into. That's why he was a roto grab. Brandon Ingram got his bell rung. Hopefully he doesn't have a concussion. We don't have the, the word on that one yet. Zion hurt his hip and back somewhere in the middle of this ball game. So all of a sudden the Pelicans who were in this amazing era wave of good vibes, may have lost two of their best players on the same night. Hopefully not for too long in either way. Uh, it means you're going to get a very heavy dose of C.J. McCollum. So if you drafted him, 
he's on path for a whole bunch of stuff. Herb Jones fouled out, did play 35 minutes first. He'll be better. You know, turnovers, missed free throws, all that stuff is weird. His steals and blocks haven't been where you'd expect them to be. That's why he's outside the top 200. In fact, he does not have a steal yet, and he's shooting 37% from the field and 78% at the foul line. If you don't think that's a guy who's ripe for bouncing back, he's a little bit of a buy low, although at the same time, his role is mostly going to be defense. But as sort of a second corollary to that, guys like Ingram, McCollum, Zion, these guys miss time. They just do consistently. CJ more so the last two, three years, but, you know, recency bias being what it is. At, that's another reason to, to look at a guy like Herb because he's getting dropped in leagues, and I think folks are going to regret that. Meanwhile, the real ad here, if we sort of dodge the Herb discussion, is Trey Murphy, who was already kind of hanging right on the edge of it, and he was watch list fodder, played 40 minutes in this game, and pretty much just took the Ingram minutes. So add Murphy. If Ingram has to miss any time at all, Trey is a very obvious stream. Uh, I'm not starting him when that team's healthy. But again, I, you know, this might this game start might have been the last time that everybody's healthy on that team all year. They're just a dinged up kind of roster. Minnesota beat OKC. No massive surprises in that ball game on either side. Shea sat this one out, and that's going to be happening throughout the year. It's one of the things you knew would be happening on a team that uh, wants to lose. And in his absence, Josh Giddy turned an ankle halfway through, and still nobody emerged with fantasy value. Lou Dort is going to take too many shots. His percentages are atrocious, but if he takes 20 shots a game, you probably need to have him rostered. And that really is only the case when Shea is out. When Shea is in, you start him, and him alone pretty much at this point. Like, Josh Giddy, injury or not, has not been... Uh, like an ex- I guess he's right around the edge of the top 100. Fine, you can start Giddy too. I'll give him, I'll cut him some slack. He's been fine. Sorry, uh, apologies. He hasn't been that bad. But outside of those two guys, like I keep getting all these questions. What about Dora? What about Robinson Earl? What about Trey Mann? What about no, no, just don't. Poku not starting all of a sudden. If someone else emerges consistently playing 27 or more minutes per game. I'll give him a look. Until that happens, I'm not going to worry about it. Sacramento Golden State, only 255 points in this game. I think they were 150-ish at halftime. So, like, this appeared to be on pace for about a 270-point ball game, and they didn't get there. So, you know, oh, no. A uh, lot of possessions, though. Malik Monk had his first kind of breakout game with the Kings. I'm not adding him. You know, you get hot off the bench. Kevin Herter is the guy I'm kind of keeping an eye on because Sabonis is rostered. Fox, Keegan Murray, those guys are all rostered. Uh, Kevin Herter is the guy who's going to be hovering right near the edge of it. He had two really good games to start the year. This time his shot abandoned him. But I do like the five rebounds, the four assists, and basically just what kind of comes with playing on a team this fast and getting starters minutes. You almost have to end up with some kind of fantasy value. So I'll leave Herter on rosters for now, but I reserve the right to change my mind on that one at some point. Andrew Wiggins still a sell high. We're a full week into the year. He hasn't slowed down yet, but he will. We know Wiggins. We know him. He's been in the league for a decade. He's not magically going to average whatever the hell this is. You know, it's just like he got a new... Co- He's a first rounder right now. Think what you want of him. This is not Wiggins. 52% from the field with three three pointers and almost four combined steals and blocks per game? No. And not turning about one turnover in three games? We know Wiggins. The best Wiggins ever was like a 75 range guy. So if you can find someone who will take Wiggins and give you back someone in the 60 to 70 range, you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself a small profit over the course of the year. And if you can do any better than that, great. No additional notes on this ballgame. Phoenix finally got a win. They've been playing ugly so far this year. Um, Cam Johnson looked a little better. Only played 23 minutes. Only took six shots, which I'm not super thrilled about. And, you know, losing playing time to Torrey Craig is not something you're going to put on your pantheon of heroes wall board or whatever for Cam Johnson. But, look, he looked better, and that's all that really matters. He's a hold there, as is 
the rest of the starting five for the Phoenix Suns. Clippers, on the other hand, uh, like one of the things, one of the lessons I think we learned at the end of last offseason, I can't remember if we did a whole show on it, but one of the main lessons is don't draft guys that you know are in a timeshare because at that point you're drafting on hope. Even guys with great fantasy stat sets, the only exception to that rule is like if you think you've got a young guy who's likely to move into a better position as the year goes but is already fantasy relevant like an Onyeka Okongwu uh or Onyeka I should say he's in a timeshare but he's good enough like he'll get top 100 value in a timeshare so then everything beyond that is gravy the Clippers are the opposite example of that Norman Powell he's not going to get it done in 22 ish minutes per ball game Rob Covington, we saw do it in a very limited sample size towards the end of last year, but he's not even getting 20 minutes a game, so that would have been a tough sell. Marcus Morris saw more time in this one, but he's in a timeshare. John Wall, timeshare. Reggie Jackson, timeshare. The only guys that aren't, and there's three of them on the Clippers, although you wouldn't know it by yesterday's game, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi's on, in ramp-up mode right now. He'll get there, don't worry. And then Ivica Zubats, because there isn't really a traditional backup center. Like, no, there's no Isaiah Hartenstein left, but Marcus Morris, stretch five, Nick Batum, stretch five, Rob Covington, stretchiest of the stretch five. And you saw, they went to that type of look. Zubats only got 21 minutes. He has come back to earth after that ridiculous first game against the Lakers. And to no one's surprise, he's back just outside the top 100. Clippers are a mess. I don't want any part of the non-superstars there. I'm going to be very excited. I don't think you can buy low on Kawhi, but if you could, this would obviously be the time to do it. Uh, before we turn the, turn the clock back to Saturday, I want to remind you guys that this podcast is brought to you by our buddies over at Thrive Fantasy. The Thrive Fantasy app and the Thren Thrive Fantasy.com. They are a very exciting partner to have because, number one, it's technically a DFS website, but it's prop bets. They give you 20 props to choose from. You pick your 10 favorites, over or under. They're all over-unders on individual players. And if you and you collect points based basically on how likely a particular prop is to hit. So you could try to pick 10 easy ones and get them all to hit, or you could try to go the hard route, rack up points a little faster when they hit, but you know, lower likelihood that they come through. So that's the strategy of it, which is a little bit more like sports betting than DFS. You, you pile them all together, and if you get... Not the most, but in the upper echelon of points, that's how you win your tournaments. That's how you win money. And right now, for a limited time, if you use promo code ETHOS when you sign up or sign up over at ThriveFantasy.com, you get a deposit match bonus up to 250 freaking dollars, which is the biggest deposit match promo that Thrive ever runs. They've offered it to just us here at Sports Ethos as part of a partnership thrivefantasy.com prop up with promo code ethos and check the podcast description for the link to go do it that way we've got a, a special hyperlink you can use url hyperlink boy that sounds exciting and new and technologically innovative uh you can go to the website using the link that we provide then you don't even have to worry about the promo code but that's how you'll get that deposit match bonus uh tell scott over there we said hey Thrive. Super cool, man. I, I Like I've said before, I actually kind of hate DFS. Uh, I don't at all hate prop bets. And our DFS team, DFS Today, the podcast, those guys are giving you Thrive bets to play on a daily basis. They're just helping you build your card. So, yeah, pretty easy decision. Saturday, second leg of our reverse chronological lightning round here on uh, Monday morning. San Antonio and Philly, that was the slightly earlier game. Uh-oh, panic mode in Philadelphia. So one of the differences here, Joel Embiid finally had a big ball game, by the way. The difference here between Philly and, like, a Los Angeles that also hasn't won is that we all knew the Lakers were going to stink coming into this year. Uh, we all thought the La Philly was going to be good. I did. This is a game they cannot lose to a team that's likely to be tanking at some point this season. But in the meantime, Spurs are racking up puntos. Vassell looks great. Keldon looks great. Pirtle even hung in there against Embiid. Trey Jones, I would argue, is kind of the only buzzy spur that hasn't really been all that great so far this year. And he was the one that felt like maybe he was going a little bit too soon. As it stands, he's right around his ADP. So we're hanging in there okay on him. 
which I think goes to just sort of point to the fact that the Spurs have been awesome for fantasy so far. Keldon is number 42. Remember, that's what we were talking about, man, trying to get him up into that 40 range. Devin Vassell, 86, and that was after a terrible first game. Having fun, rocking and a-rolling. Where's Pirtle? I think he's lower because they had a hack of Pirtle game. Yeah, that damnable free throw percentage. He'll be back. I don't think he's a buy low. I think people know like what they're getting into, but his blocks are going to mean revert up. And the free throw situation, he's not going to average eight free throws a game. That's a small sample size theater. As Philly goes, uh, good to see Embiid get going. Harden's shot cooled off, but he nearly triple-doubled and also had two blocks in that one. Tobias Harris, I mean, this was the fear with him, is that a lot of stuff would come down. He's still hanging in the top 70, but again, like, two defensive stats per game as soon as that levels off. Bye-bye. So if you can get anything for him, I would do it. Tyrese Maxey's just inside the top 150, mostly because he hasn't done anything besides score so far this year. Now, he's a little bit better in this ball game. Hopefully, that's a trend for Maxi. We'll see. That was my fear, though, with him. I didn't, like... It just seemed like last year was about as good as it could get as long as James Harden was blocking him from any real ball-handling duties offensively. The other note on this one is DeAnthony Melton. I think we pretty much need to move on. And, like, with the caveat that I'm going to jump back on the Melton thing as soon as it looks like he's starting to see more time, but right now he isn't, so I can't. I can't squat on that. He's fully useless in fantasy for the first week of the year. And, you know, it, it, whatever progression we're going to get there is probably going to be a slow one or possibly injury-related. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you can do. If you can just sit him on your bench for a while, I guess you could, but damn, I need those roster spots. Indy beat Detroit, tank battle, which I guess to that end, Indy lost the tank battle. Halliburton was solid, no surprise there. The fun stuff was that Jalen Smith came roaring back, huge double-double with three blocks. Isaiah Jackson got over 20 minutes, which is what we were looking for, had five blocks, beautiful. Buddy Heald cooled off, uh, and they just yanked him early in this one. Um, he'll be okay. Chris Duarte, we called a drop last week. We're sticking with that one. Benedict Matherin looks amazing. Holy crap, they've just turned him loose so fast. And then Goga Batadze had a nice double-double off the bench. Uh, he's watch list at best. We know enough about Goga to know not to take that plunge. His both percentages tend to actually be a problem for him. Um, he's just like, there's a speed thing. Against most NBA teams, he can't really keep up. Luckily, Detroit is not most NBA team. Piss and stink. Sadiq Bey was better. Cade was a little better. Bowen Bogdanovich cooled off a bit, but he's solid enough. Jaden Ivey looked really good again. 17-11-5. Missed some free throws, had some turnovers. No surprises there for the Rook, but that's another guy that's getting turned loose quicker than expected. And then Jalen Duran, who we're all kind of watching, he didn't do as much in his 18-19 minutes a game, but again, it, it really seems like he only needs about 20-21 so I, I think I'd stick with that one for now. Boston beat Orlando. Al Horford sat this one out. So Grant Williams becomes a really good stream. Any of those back-to-back. -back. So just sort of keep a, a half eye on Boston's schedule. And Grant's actually been good even without the back-to-back. -back, but this makes it a very obvious move. His efficiency's been crazy so far this year. The other note is that Derek White suddenly looks really good. Last two games in the starting lineup, he's been much better. Uh, he belongs on rosters. And I, like, there's a real possibility that he pushes Malcolm Brogdon into what we saw in this ballgame, which is sort of relegated to bench scorer. And if that's the case, they might just cannibalize each other. But for the moment, I would lean Derek White between those two guys. But damn, Grant Williams looks amazing so far. You know who else looks amazing in, a, in the surprise twist of the century is Terrence Ross. Now, he's not going to have this job forever because Jalen Suggs is out, Markel Fultz is out. When Orlando gets healthy, if they get healthy... You figure Ross is going to get marginalized a bit. But for the time being, he's out there and he's just racking up shots. And I do think Orlando wants to win this year. I know everybody's talking about the tank battle. I don't think the Magic are trying to lose. You're seeing the efficiency stuff with Paolo. That's going to be a thing. Franz Wagner finally got himself a little bit more involved in this ballgame. Uh, but Mo Bamba's a drop also. It's sort of the same story as DeAnthony Melton, although Melton was going way earlier in drafts. Bamba was going 
way at the tail end, and uh, now we see why. They just they gave him a bunch of money, and they don't want to play him. Whatever. Um, I guess I'm adding Terrence Ross in a couple of spots, but I think we all know how that one's going to turn out. We already talked Cleveland. We didn't talk Chicago yet. Zach Levine came back in this game, and apparently everything just got disrupted. Let's hold on to Io, see how it plays out. We need a little, like, dust settling to go on here. This is a terrible ball game. It was a blowout. The regulars were out of the game relatively early. Levine looked decent, though, you know, to that end at least. No, no, no adjustments based on this one. Let's get better data points. Oh, well, Alperen Sengun has a cold, but he came off the bench behind Usman Garuba anyway, even with no Bruno Fernando. I mean, the Rockets are yanking Sengun around at this point, and that's going to be a real pain in the butt. Lots of questions about Eason. His playing time isn't even close to enough right now. Brooke Lopez! Oh, yes! This is old man central right now, and Brolo's a second rounder through two ball games thanks to an average of three and a half blocks per game <laughs> and three and a half three-pointers. He's just so... I, we all forgot. I guess I didn't. That's why I was on the old man squad. Everybody forgot. That Brooke Lopez is this team's rim protection on defense. He was so pivotal to what they do, and having him out all year is a big reason why the Bucks didn't just sort of roll the league during the regular season. They were good, but teams were able to score on him, and it's just not going to be as easy this season because now you've got Holiday, terrific perimeter defender, Giannis, who can defend everywhere, and then Lopez, who's still one of the best rim protectors in the NBA. And box out artist extraordinaire. What I am curious about is Bobby Portis. This feels like about the line you're looking for from him. Okay. Miami beat Toronto. Uh, Scotty Barnes turned an ankle. We don't know. I think he's questionable as of right now for their next ball game. If he doesn't play, well, in this last one, Precious Achua picked up the minutes, but he's a really not a good fantasy player. Chris Boucher is actually questionable. If he plays and they actually give him a normal allotment of minutes, he would be the fill-in I would pick. But I don't think that I can trust him coming back and playing his first game of the year, so I'd probably just leave this replacement situation alone. Speaking of replacement situations, Caleb Martin got ejected and suspended for a game. He and... A bunch of little scuffle in this one. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on Caleb Martin. I really do think that he's going to come around for the Heat at some point. But right now, if he's out, it's not entirely clear how the Heat are going to play this thing, but Max Struess got most of the playing time in the last one. He's typically a three-point streamer, happened to get a little bit of other stuff in this ballgame. Uh, so maybe that's the, rec the direction you go, or do they play ultra small? I don't really know. The Heat aren't as deep as usual this season. Would I trust Max Struess in a games cap format? Probably not. Would I pick him up for a head-to-head -head stream? Maybe. But, you know, again, you're sort of like, is it worth it for the one game? Dallas blew out Memphis, 137-96. Uh, Grizzlies just had nothing in the tank for this one. Luka was stellar. Christian Wood was much better. Didn't miss all of his free throws, so that's good. And uh, nobody else in the Mavericks was remotely close to fantasy value. As far as the Grizzlies go, Desmond Bain, still a huge buy-low opportunity on him. Brandon Clark, probably droppable right now. He's mostly logging backup center minutes. Uh, I still have hope, though, because he's such a... He's so good in 21 minutes of ballgame, and he's just not that far from there. But if you dropped him... Here's the, here's the question. If I drop player X, will someone scoop them up right away and if you think the answer is no which i kind of do with clark right now if you think the answer is no then that means you could drop them and almost use the waiver wire like one extra roster slot you just have to be ready like you got to watch the first half of every single grizzlies game and make sure that he doesn't log 12 minutes in the first half instead of eight and a half because if he does you kind of need to go re-grab someone like that at halftime we've talked okc denver a healthy Denver Nuggets team is going to be interesting at some point this year. They have no defense. They're, they're, the chemistry is weird at the moment. But 
Uh, I mean, like offensively, they're going to be very hard to deal with. They just couldn't hit their free throw. I think this game almost could have been a blowout if Denver hit a few free throws. They didn't. But Michael Porter Jr. looked really good. The efficiency is back where it needs to be. KCP is probably addable in most formats. I didn't personally think he was going to get enough usage to be that, but he's number 63 in nine cat right now on what are like not far from sustainable numbers. What I don't know about is the 47% shooting, but the other stuff could kind of stick where it's at. And he's going to have wide open looks on this club, but I don't know. I mean, 13 shots he got in this ball game. He took more shots than Jokic. I mean, that is the, that's the Jokic way, though. If he can get somebody else wide open, he's probably going to do it. Nuggets hit 23 pointers. Still shot almost 50% from the field. Jamal Murray, he's coming around slowly but surely. 27 and change minutes in this one. He'll probably continue to slowly work his way back up into the normal range. Hope you guys sold high on Aaron Gordon. Bones is probably droppable also. Speaking of late round flyers, he's looked horrible so far this year. Talk Clippers already, talk Kings already, so that takes us through the end of Saturday. And before we do Friday, I got to tell you guys about Manscaped.com, one of our other delightful partners here on the podcast. Here's what I want you guys to do. I get it. Maybe you're not ready to make that big investment in a lawnmower 4.0. Maybe you don't need a massive sideburn trimmer. It's not massive. It's just like the idea of it is massive. Start with something smaller, okay? Do that for me. Move to something smaller, like, say, uh, I don't know, the three-blade razor, which is fantastic. I use that as well. The three-blade razor, which I think they call the shaver, is only 20 bucks. It comes with four replacement blades as well, so it's going to last you... I don't know how often you guys go through blades. If you're shaving your face every single day, then you probably go through blades a little bit faster. But for many folks, you know, every day, every other day, every whatever, like week, <laughs> this, the work at home era, uh, four blades might last you like a quarter to a, th- to a half a year. That's 20 bucks right now. And then if you use our coupon code, Ethos20, you could take another 20% off of that and drop it down to 16 plus free shipping on your order. It has big lubrication strips on the top and the bottom of it. That's one of the reasons that I really like it because it really, really, really does a nice job of priming my face. I have a very sensitive neck, sensitive skin. So if you actually want a tight shave and you have sensitive skin, this is a fantastic three-blade razor to use. And again, 16 bucks after you use the coupon. Or... As, again, I pointed out, I think, on Friday's show, my wife was like, you got to tell people that I also use uh, the luxury nail kit, which I'm having trouble finding on the website right now. Is it under sets? Lifestyle. It's under lifestyle. No, it's not there either. Where the hell are you, luxury nail kit? I've lost it. It's somewhere on the website. (laughs) It's terrible that I couldn't find it for you. Uh, But that's called the Shears and... They are very effective. I've got it on my desk right here in front of me. That's also 20 bucks before you use the coupon, 16 after. So check out the shears. Check out the crop shaver. Those things are just 16 after coupon ethos20 at manscaped.com. They just make good stuff. Now, obviously, if you want to go big and get the sideburn trimmer, do it. The lawnmower 4.0 is sweet. You got the uh, adjustable blades you can add to it. So if you're like doing your, your shaving your beard, whatever... Um, go check them out. Ethos 20, 20% off free shipping, manscaped.com. Those guys are great. Happy to have them back again. Finally, Friday. Let's wrap this thing up. Any teams we did not cover the rest of the weekend? And I, there's always one, but it's always hard for me to find it. Brooklyn. That was it. Is there another one? Uh, the Knicks, both New York teams. I don't think played over the weekend. I think I'm getting that right. Yeah. Nets and Knicks. There you go. Uh, So the Nets are, I don't know, not massive surprises. We talked about Royce O'Neal in the middle of last week as he played 39 minutes even with Joe Harris coming back in this one. I am kind of curious how the minutes shake out once Harris is full strength. If Seth Curry comes back soon, how does that impact things? For the moment, 
And uh, believe me, I, like Roto Games Caps, I, I am nervous that I'm going to drop Royce O'Neal into a lineup. Harris's minutes are going to go up by eight or nine, and they're going to come all from Royce. And then all of a sudden, like that's a guy, he's in the the full Marvin Thad line, which that e- expression on this show doesn't make sense anymore because Thad Young, after he got moved to Chicago, actually became a much better per 36 guy than he was before. But originally, we're talking like two, three years ago, the Marvin Thad line was something we talked about on this podcast as 30 minutes. Guys like Marvin Williams, guys like Thaddeus Young needed 30 minutes to have fantasy value. And Royce O'Neal is kind of in that Marvin Thad group where he actually probably needs more like 32 or 33 minutes to hit fantasy value. And he's getting that right now. But on a night-to-night basis, I don't still necessarily trust that it'll continue. This is two-game sample size. where The Nets are one of the teams that didn't get to play very much this first week. Now, Nick Claxton looks like a go. Ben Simmons is obviously a go, but, you know, if you could have dodged him, you should have dodged him. But O'Neal is the one that's still a little bit up in the air. I just need a little bit more data. Take that for data, say the Nets schedule makers. And then on the Knicks side, they're coming off a blowout, so we really didn't get to take much away from that one, other than Isaiah Hardenstein looked really good, uh, even in more of a traditional backup role. What I do want to know is how much does Hart get to play if the game is close late and Robinson is playing well enough. Because Mitchell Robinson played a little better in this ball game, but the Knicks got to run reserves the entire fourth quarter. That's why Quickly had a big game. That's why Toppin had a bigger ball game. What does that mean for Hartenstein under a normal circumstance? Like, we know Tibbs is not playing this guy's 27, 28 minutes if the game is even remotely within striking distance. Brunson, Barrett, Randall, those guys are all going to get close to 37. So we're talking anywhere from 9 to 11 extra minutes that came from the bench in this ballgame. Does Hartenstein only get to play 16, 17 minutes in a closer game? Well, how does this thing finish? Or is is he, is this Robinson-Hartenstein thing, is that really a, a true timeshare? Because if it is, then Hartenstein can do more than enough in 22 to 24 minutes of ballgame. We've seen that before. Anything more than that is just beyond icing on the cake. All that to say, you're obviously holding Hardenstein because he's been good in his first two games, but he's another guy we're looking for a little bit more data on, and hopefully we will get that soon. One reminder again, everybody, please do take a moment to rate and review the podcast. I didn't bother you guys much about that during the run-up to the season, but I'm going to bother you about it now because uh, every time someone subscribes to the pod or drops a five-star review on it, we just get a little tick up the iTunes leaderboard, and then more people can randomly come across the show. So please do, particularly on iTunes, Spotify, helpful as well. Uh, In the podcast app on your mobile device, search for Fantasy NBA Today. They've made it extraordinarily difficult to find the rating and review button on your mobile device. It's much easier on iTunes on a computer. But if you can find it, please do. Five-star review. I love you forever. I am Dan Baspers. This was Reverse Chronological Lightning Round Monday. Hit me up on Twitter. We got stuff to do in between shows. That's at Dan Baspers. And we are still looking... For one more DFS analyst over here, we are also looking for NFL and MLB full season fantasy experts. Hit me up on Twitter about those or email roster at sportsethos.com. Also, go get a fantasy pass, you cheapskates. Try it out for a month. You're going to love it. See you guys tomorrow. Off season over. (laughs) I still can't get used to it. In season episode number six. Let's see if I can do this all year. Spoiler alert. I can't. Goodbye. Are you ready? Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day is coming on October 26th. Amazon will host live hiring events in your city to showcase all the reasons why this Amazon Warehouse is the place to work. Things like competitive pay, great benefits, and so much more. Drop in for some swag, bring a friend, and you could even walk away with a job. To find an Amazon Warehouse Hiring Day event close to you, visit Amazon.com slash hiring day. That's Amazon.com slash hiring day. Amazon is an equal opportunity employer.